see if got it. Okay, uh, this is also being transmitted in. That's right. I see it in YouTube. YouTube. Yeah. Okay. Hello, everyone. Greetings from the United States. <laughs> Hello. Hello. So it's four o'clock. Uh, still some people arriving, so maybe we just uh, wait for a minute or two. Okay, I don't know. Uh, okay, I have here a small introduction about our guest today. So I suppose I should start. Okay, four o'clock, I'll be on time. So uh, hello everyone. Welcome to the third talk uh, of the International Seminars Program organized by the School of Science of the University of Minho. Uh, today we have the, the pleasure to have with us Professor Martin Grebel from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Martin was, was born in, in Stuttgart, Germany, but uh, takes his higher education in the United States, obtaining both his BC and PhD at the Presbyterian University of California at Berkeley. Then he did a postdoc at the also prestigious institu institution Caltech, after which he joined the faculty at the University of Illinois in 1992. There he holds currently several positions. He is the James R. Eisen Chair in Chemistry, Professor of Physics, Professor of Biophysics and Quantitative Biology, Professor in Center for Advanced Studies, and Professor in, in the Carl Illinois College of Medicine. I hope I'll, I'll list them all. Uh, in the in this almost 30 years, he built an international recognized research group with several interests that include protein and RNA folding, fast dynamic in life cells, dimensional energy flow in molecules, uh, quantum computing, measurement and control, nanoscale uh, uh, imaging and excited states, glass in dynamics and locomotion, uh, lo uh, locomotion behavior. Um, all this uh, research activity has in common the implementation of state-of-the-art laser techniques to interrogate and manipulate complex molecular systems coupled with quantum or classical simulations. The result of these effort, efforts are contributing to a deeper understanding of the way that proteins fall in functional three-dimensional molecules, the details of how chemical bonds are broken by vibrational motion and how this can be controlled in the switching of energy flow in large molecule structures on surfaces. Today, he's going to talk about his most recent work related with the dynamics of biomolecules, both in vitro and in the cell with the, present, uh, with, with the presentation entitled Biomolecule Folding and Association from in vitro to in cell. Martin, thank you very much All right. for accepting our invitation. Please go ahead. This virtual stage is now yours. Thank you. And I just want to make sure again my microphone is okay. Can everybody hear me? If somebody gives me a thumbs up that uh, it looks like you, know, you can hear me, right? Good. All right. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. I guess one of the few good things that came out of the pandemic is that people started getting used to remote talks and using Zoom and things of that sort. And as a result, we have done exactly the same thing. You know, we, use not, we don't have a budget to bring in international speakers every week, right? But now we can have uh, some of them just come by Zoom and, and uh, give us the lecture that way and have the locals uh, drive instead. So uh, let me actually share my screen and get into the show and make sure that everybody can see this. Let's see here. There we go. And again, just want to make sure is everybody okay with the screen? It's large enough, you can see. All right, great. Um, 
So uh, I'm going to talk about biomolecule folding and association dynamics, and I'm going to have actually a fairly brief in vitro part. I'll just talk for a few minutes about that, and then talk mostly about our recent work where we have looked at in-cell dynamics uh, of both protein folding and, and protein association. Uh, the work I'm going to talk about is, of course, done by the students and postdocs in the group. I, I help, but... Uh, with uh, you know, data analysis and paper writing, but they are the ones who are in the lab, um, in the trenches. Uh, and so the work I'm going to talk about today was done by uh, uh, Caitlin Davis, Rupe Feng, uh, Drishti Gwyn, uh, Meredith Rickert, who actually just got her PhD last week, uh, Shahar Sukenik, uh, Yi Zhang, and some of the calculations are collaborative work with Taras uh, Pogorilov. Um, and in addition, I should always acknowledge our funders. We've been generously funded by the National Science Foundation of the United States and by the National Institutes of Health. And actually, the, the one good thing about having a chair in the US, I don't actually know what the situation is in Portugal, is uh, the, then you get money from that. And the Eisner family is the one who endowed uh, my chair. So this is very nice because you can use that money to do anything you want, right? If you get a grant, you have to do what the grant says. <laughs> the family does not care <laughs> what I do with their, with their research money, so I can start new things usually. Okay, but let's, uh, let's get launched into the uh, talk. And so I'm gonna start off with uh, uh, some suggestions that came from theory and computation in the 1990s, which I would say really was a renaissance in, in protein folding and protein dynamics. Of course, protein folding and dynamics are quite old fields. Uh, the first crystal structure has been around since the 1950s and people uh, sort of understood the potential reversibility of folding of at least small proteins in the 1960s. Um, but there were a couple of interesting things that happened in the uh, uh, early to mid to late 90s. Uh, one, uh, was some theoretical work that actually used uh, statistical mechanics uh, to describe how proteins fold and came to the interesting conclusion that uh, while usually protein folding is going to be a two-state process, so like an ordinary chemical reaction with an activation barrier between an unfolded state on the left here and a folded state on the uh, uh, right-hand side, that if you made a protein really particularly stable, so if I use my hands here to wave, you could take that free energy well, and you could actually make the folded state over on this side more and more stable, sort of tilt that over, uh, and eventually have not even an activation barrier. So you could tilt the surface strongly in favor of the native state and have what's called, uh, called downhill folding. Um, and likewise, if you are, say, at high temperature where folding is not favored, uh, then you could actually have um, downhill unfolding. So the reason this happens is because of a compensation of enthalpy and entropy during this chemical reaction, because folding of a protein is just another chemical reaction. Um, and this compensation happens because proteins are big. So unlike say a small organic molecule, uh, where I go through a transition state and there's really not that much in the structure of the transition state that you can change, it's what it is. In a protein, you have this big chain. And as I make a contact that lowers the enthalpy, I also lower the entropy at the same time. So, that, so the enthalpy lowering is good, right? that lowers the free energy, lowering the en entropy is not good, that raises the free energy, but it does it a little bit. And when I make another contact, it does it again a little bit and so forth down until the protein has you know, completely folded. So you're taking these small steps down in enthalpy and down in entropy, one is favorable, one is unfavorable, and they compensate almost completely. Uh, and, and that's why you get relatively low barriers and also uh, why you can have folding that even essentially goes downhill. Uh, it's not always downhill, but even when it goes over a barrier, it's quite fast. You know, folding reactions take anywhere from microseconds to a few hours. And on the scale of any chemical reaction at room temperature, that's really fast. But in, in organic chemistry, if I want a reaction to go reasonably fast, I have to heat it up and put it in, an, or in a solvent and so forth. Uh, yeah. But proteins will fold perfectly happily at, at room temperature. Uh, there is a calculation that came out in 1999 by Duane and Coleman in science, where they, for the first time, attempted to fold a protein on the computer, and they couldn't get it to completely fold. Uh, they took this uh, small uh, villain headpiece here, but they got a structure after running it for one microsecond of real time in a full atom molecular dynamics simulation, which was really a, an incredible feat at the time. You know, this is now 22 years ago. Uh, and they found that it actually got into a structure that's pretty similar to what the folded state uh, 
looks like. So they were able to compute that the protein goes into a collapsed structure just using a physics force field, right? It's just using the forces and integrating Newton's equations of motion, nothing else. There's no other stuff built into the, into the uh, model. So that was very encouraging because it showed that indeed, because folding could be such a fast reaction, you can find proteins that can fold maybe in microseconds and then actually do computational folding just using Newton's equations to see if you can get proteins to fold uh, on a computer. I might add, by the way, that that's different from structure prediction. There's a lot of work going on nowadays with uh, things like uh, uh, ITASR or AlphaFold or other programs that basically use uh, machine learning to uh, mine uh, X-ray, NMR, and cryo-AM databases to come up with what folded structures of proteins look, uh, look like. And that's sort of an information-based uh, approach, you know, based on experimental data. Uh, this approach here is based just on the physics. You just run Newton's equations and, and you get uh, the protein to fold. So let me uh, give you an example of where we're at with this nowadays. So here's an in vitro experiment on the left-hand side and a movie that I'll show you in a minute on the uh, right-hand side. And in these in vitro experiments, what we tend to do is, you know, let's say a protein like the WW domain, uh, this protein called FIP35 here that I'm showing you, it's a triple-stranded beta sheet protein, uh, has a, uh, um, is stable at 23 degrees Celsius and, and a pressure of one atmosphere or 0.1 megapascal. Okay. I can increase the pressure and actually unfold this protein or I can decrease the temperature and unfold this protein. Both of those may seem a little bit unusual ways of doing it, but it turns out actually most proteins will unfold when you cool them down, not just when you heat them up. I think we all know that if I heat up a protein, it will eventually heat in nature, but you can actually cool down proteins and get them to unfold. And the reason for this is that at very low temperature, uh, when hydrophobic residues that are normally buried inside a protein get exposed to the water, then the water can form cages around those hydrophobic side chains that actually lowers the entropy of the water molecules as you go to lower temperature. Okay? So heat unfolding of a protein is really a configurational entropy effect of the chain, like the protein chain can move around more at high temperature, it will unfold. Cold unfolding is actually because water molecules can order uh, around the protein chain. So I can unfold at low temperature. And likewise, I can actually unfold proteins at high pressure. And the reason is again, just Le Chatelier's principle. It turns out when proteins fold, the amino acid side chains don't perfectly fit together, right? There's only 20 of them. They have various shapes like valines, isoleucines, you know, phenylalanines and so forth, but they don't fit together perfectly. There's always little gaps left. So it turns out actually the volume, the molar volume of a folded protein is greater than the molar volume of the unfolded protein. So by Le Chatelier's principle, if I apply pressure, I should go to the state of smallest volume and so proteins will unfold. Uh, what happens then is that water molecules can come in and solvate those regions of the protein that formerly could not quite perfectly fit together. And so actually you get reduced volume. So this is kind of a little counterintuitive because when we think of unfolding of a protein, we think you know, the chain expands, right? So the thing gets bigger, right? And that's certainly true. The radius of gyration of the protein gets bigger. But because the water molecules can now get closer everywhere along that chain, the actual molar volume is smaller, okay? So, so the protein looks bigger, but its volume uh, that's displacing the water is actually smaller. So again, what we do in these experiments is that we jump the pressure up or we cool them down and then we jump the temperature up or we jump the pressure back down and then we watch the folding kinetics. And what we found in this particular experiment here, I'm plotting for you a measurement of the logarithm of the folding and unfolding rates, Kf and Ku, as a function of the concentration of a denaturant. So a higher guanidinum hydrochloride means the protein wants to unfold over here and it wants to refold over here. And we were able to do these experiments to measure how quickly does that happen. And indeed, you know, this can happen really very quickly. So this is on a log scale. So this is e to the power of 10, right? So that's quite a large number in, in microseconds. So the folding can occur at a very high rate, in fact, about 10 microseconds. Okay? So then we did a simulation to actually see, well, is that what happens on the computer, right? Our experiment is telling us this protein could fold as quickly as 10 microseconds. Uh, and, uh, and, and by the way, it does it in two phases. So there's actually a double exponential, which tells us there must be like an intermediate step happening, okay? And so we asked, okay, if I integrate Newton's laws, First of all, will it happen in about 10 microseconds? I mean, that would already be good news. Will it fold even? That's the first question, uh, just using uh, Newton's laws and the, and the potential energy surface for the protein. Um, and will it go through some kind of intermediate step? So let me show you this movie. And what we're doing in this movie, so here's the structure, I'm rotating it so you can see the triple-stranded beta sheet. We're gonna increase the pressure 
you can see the numbers here to 9,000 bar. And so the protein is going to unfold now. So here you have the unfolded protein. You can see there's a little bit of helix that forms that shouldn't, right? Because it's a beta sheet protein, but it forms some non-native structure. Now we're going to drop the pressure back down to one atmosphere, uh, one bar. There we are. So the protein is now unfolded. And we're just running the Newton's equations to see what it does. There are also all the water molecules included, but they're not shown so that you can see the protein. You can see the chain is diffusing around. And just now, uh, the turn formed and two betas transformed. Now you can see the protein is searching on the wrong side. The blue should actually be over on the left, but it was searching on the right. But finally, it diffuses over to the left and forms the folded state. And it took about 6.2 microseconds on the computer to do this, okay? which matches actually very well with the experimental data. We've run more of those simulations. And as you might imagine, sometimes it falls in 15 microseconds. Sometimes it takes only five. And the average is actually about 10. So it's very close uh, to what we get in the experimental data. The folded structure from the force field agrees with the crystal structure to one angstrom. That's as good as the crystal structure itself. It's a typical uncertainty in the world's best crystal structures is about one angstrom. And so we can actually compute uh, with similar accuracy what the structure of the folded state of, uh, of this protein looks like. So this gives you a little bit of an idea of the things that uh, people have been able to do in vitro as far as measuring the folding of proteins on a rapid time scale and then running computer simulations uh, using basically the potential energy of interactions between the atoms and then just running molecular dynamics. So the conclusions from many years of this work, not just from my group, but from many other research groups as well, I just showed you one example from our work, uh, is that proteins have what I call shallow energy landscapes. Uh, and what I mean by that again is that they don't have huge free energy barriers or activation barriers like many say organic chemical reactions. They have small activation barriers. And also the free energy difference between the folded and unfolded state is not very large. Okay? Now you might then suspect that the free energy of a protein, whether it's folded or not, could easily be modulated by the environment. For instance, the environment inside the cell. Because inside a cell, the protein is in contact with other macromolecules. It gets crowded. There are metabolites. There are all kinds of things it's in contact with that we don't normally put in test tube experiments. And so you might expect that these might actually be able to shift around those surfaces significantly enough that it might be folded under one condition or unfolded under some other condition. And uh, people in the field like to separate out the contributions uh, into two contributions. One is crowding on the left here. And one is what we call a quinary structure, or sometimes also when it's not functional, we call it sticking. Okay? So let me explain those two things very briefly uh, for you, again, uh, using a movie. So uh, the, the experiment, the simulation that I just showed you is like five years ago or something like that. Okay? But it is now you know, uh, 2021. And so we have made progress in the simulations. So we can actually now simulate on a computer parts of the cytoplasm of a cell with all the atoms. So every single water molecule, every atom, every metabolite, every protein molecule, you know, all the ATPs, the glutamates, the uh, lipids, everything that's inside the cell. Uh, we can actually run atom by atom computer simulations using Newton's force laws. So here's a little slice taken out of a cytoplasm with some of the proteins being highlighted in the center. And uh, I will run this computer simulation for you. Again, this is integrating Newton's equations for the known or the best available force field of the interaction between the atoms. And you can see that the proteins diffuse around like that little blue guy here in light blue is sort of diffused down, but then it sticks to the orange guy for a while. Now diffused over here, and now it diffused over to this pink protein and it sticks there for a while. And then it diffuses over to the blue one and it sticks to that one for a while. And so this is typical for the kind of motion that proteins undergo inside the cytoplasm, they'll diffuse for a while in some space that has water in it. The empty spaces here are not empty, right? They're completely filled with water, of course, and, and, and small molecules. And then it sticks to something for a while uh, by attractive forces. And then it comes loose again and is able to move around again. But the volume in which it moves is reduced. So that's what we mean by crowding, right? There's a lot of other macromolecules around. So this little uh, blue protein here doesn't have 100% of the volume that it can move around and it only has half the volume or so because the other half is occupied by macromolecules. And we call this excluded volume or crowding. And usually that stabilizes compact states, right? Because again, if I have less volume available by Le Chatelier's principle, I'm going to favor the more compact states. Okay? In addition to crowding, there's also sticking. You saw it, you know, this the little blue protein sometimes kind of gets stuck on another protein for a while and, and waits there. So let me show you a simulation 
of this that's a pharmaceutical in this interest. We're also interested in pharmaceutical uh, proteins. Uh, that, uh, for instance, like insulin that's been labeled with a, phosph uh, with a uh, uh, polyethylene glycol. And what you're seeing here is actually a test molecule uh, protein called Lambda 685 that has been labeled with a chain of polyethylene glycol, which is pharmaceutical additive that people hook up to proteins so they have a longer lifetime in your bloodstream and don't get excreted by the kidneys uh, as quickly. And again, when you have these two macromolecules near one another, there's a strong interaction. And you can actually see the, the PEG or polyethylene glycol is not just randomly moving around. It's almost like a snake, right? That's trying to and, you know, put its coils around this amino acid residue on the surface of the protein. And that's a very typical interaction that we actually see that polymers like uh, polyethylene glycol will actually make interactions with hydrophilic and hydrophobic residues on the surface of a protein that can last for quite a long time. And the polymer can even form helical structure. Okay? Um, so rather than having that completely random polymer, you actually get a degree of ordering when they interact with protein surfaces. And then finally, as I mentioned, uh, you know, sticking and quinary structure, this is one example. Um, proteins inside cells can even attract one another when they have the same charge. Right? It seems again a little bit counterintuitive because Coulomb repulsion, right? the proteins should repel the closer I put them to one another. But if you actually measure the attractive force between a pair of proteins that have the same charge and like these SH3 domains here, and we measured this using concentration dependent small angle X-ray scattering, here's the potential energy that you get between the two proteins. So at a long distance, you know, the potential energy is zero. And then as I get the two proteins closer and closer together, the potential energy increases. That's what you would expect. They're both negatively charged. They should repel one another with a screened Coulomb potential. But if I get close enough, all of a sudden it turns around and the potential energy uh, goes down uh, before it finally shoots up. So what's happening there is if I get the two proteins close enough uh, to one another, there's eventually only a single layer of water molecules left between the two proteins. This really reduces the entropy of those water molecules being able to move around. So actually by diffusing out of the gap between the proteins and the two proteins coming together, those water molecules are able to increase their entropy. So that's actually favorable for the system. So the reason the energy goes down here is not because of the repulsion disappearing, the proteins are still repelling one another, but because the free energy of the solvent molecules is going down. Okay? And that's basically causing this dip here. And finally, of course, if I squeeze the proteins too much together, then you know, that's it. And basically I don't end up uh, getting a, uh, you know, I get a repulsion between the proteins. Okay, so what I want to talk about in, in the rest of the talk is address uh, some of these, uh, uh, um, uh, let's see here. Some of these seven or uh, some of these questions, actually I added a seventh one, it says six up there, but you know, I probably won't get through all seven of them anyway. Um, so I'm just gonna run uh, through these questions here one by one that have to do with how proteins fold and how they interact with one another uh, inside cells. I think I will at least get to number five, which is on uh, how uh, intrinsically disordered proteins uh, behave in liquid-liquid phase separation. And I might not be able to get to six and seven. Okay, so let's get started with number one here. So how sticky is the cytoplasm actually for proteins when you have a protein inside a cell? And how quickly do proteins get stuck to other things and become unstuck? Does it take nanoseconds, microseconds, milliseconds? What is the time scale of that process so one can compare it with other biological processes inside the cell? So here's one way that we address this question. It's to run uh, computer simulations of uh, uh, an all atom model of the cytoplasm, like the one that I just showed you. So here's another uh, version of that model. And you can see each one of those spheres that you see here is actually an ion, like a potassium ion or a chloride or a phosphate or something like that. And each one of those small molecules here is a metabolite, like an ATP or a glutamate or some molecule like that. And then the other proteins are shown in, in blue here. And I'm highlighting one particular protein. This is again, this WW domain halfway through folding, right? Remember how it first formed two of the beta strands and then the third one was searching around and then eventually the third one formed. So this one has been caught halfway uh, through its uh, folding process. So we ran uh, this uh, simulation of a bacterial cytoplasm. Uh, here we have the ion and small molecule composition that corresponds as best as people know from experiments to the cytoplasm. And we ran simulations of about 16 proteins in this case in the cytoplasm-like environment. 
And here's what we found when we looked at how long does any pair of proteins stick together? Okay? So what we did is we just analyzed the simulation, looked at every pair of proteins and asked, you know, how, how long do they stick together and made a histogram, which shows basically the uh, uh, fraction of events um, uh, as a function of how long the event lasted. So how long did it stick? Okay? And you can see it actually follows, this is a log log plot, right? This is a straight line that has a slope of minus one. So it's a power law. Uh, with a slope of minus one. And so you end up having a lot of events that are very short lived, like a few tens of nanoseconds, and you have much fewer events that are very long lived, like tens of microseconds. And the average event time is about you know, 0.1 uh, to one microsecond, so about 100 nanoseconds to a microsecond. And it turns out actually you can even explain this power to the minus one if you think of this sticking and unsticking as a birth death process that's driven by diffusion. Uh, of a complex that forms and then breaks again. Think of it like a, it's a complex between two proteins, but not a very good one because it's not, you know, they're just sticking briefly and then going apart. It's not like hemoglobin where you make the real complex and it sticks together, right? It just comes together and falls apart. So you can think of this as a birth death process for the complex driven by diffusion. And actually theory predicts in that case uh, that the probability of the length of how long it lasts should go as inverse time. So that's exactly what we see uh, in those simulations. And so it confirmed uh, this theoretical model uh, using a molecular simulation. Um, another interesting thing that I mentioned is the sticking. So if we simulate, for instance, the folding of a protein uh, inside uh, water, so in vitro, what we typically see is there is a lot of oscillations of the size of the protein, the radius of gyration as a function of time. So the protein sort of gets bigger and smaller and bigger and smaller and just samples around randomly like it was doing in that movie that I showed you. And then eventually it goes through the transition state and finds the folded state and then it's folded and that's it and it stays you know, together. Inside a cell, things are a little more complicated. So here's a simulation for the same protein inside a cytoplasm instead of in water. And you, get, you can see that it sometimes undergoes these fluctuations, but then they stop for a while and it just kind of you know, fluctuates much less. And then it fluctuates again and then it stops again for a while and, and does so much less. And this is not the folded state, right? So what's actually happening here before it eventually goes into the folded state is the protein is diffusing around inside the cell and it finds a different protein and it sticks to it for a while and then it doesn't fluctuate much, right? And then it comes off again and starts fluctuating around again and moving again around inside the cell. And that's what you're seeing here. So there's this intermittent motion. Uh, there's even worse things that can happen inside cells. Uh, we all know, for instance, that amyloid diseases are thought to start by forming uh, beta sheet aggregates, right, that are oligomers. And then eventually these oligomers can actually form um, much longer lived fibrils and, and eventually plaques. Okay? So here, what we saw in one of our in-cell simulations is we have this unfolded protein that has some partial alpha helical structure, and it comes into contact with another protein that's completely folded. In this case, it's an enzyme called superoxide dismutase. And so this orange protein actually comes into contact with this enzyme and sticks to it, and it actually interacts with this blue helix here and unfolds it. You can see the helix here has become partly unfolded. And then this protein diffuses away again, 50 microseconds later in the simulation. And then the protein actually comes, diffuses back again to the superoxide dismutase and actually binds uh, to the superoxide dismutase, what used to be a helix, to form a double-stranded beta sheet. Okay? And then it diffuses off again and comes back again. So here's actually a case where an unfolded protein can come into contact with another protein, unfold a part of it, and then bind to it and actually form a uh, beta sheet, which is the first step in forming you know, beta sheet-like aggregates that eventually could form amyloids. Okay? So you can see an example here in a computer simulation where we can actually see how this kind of uh, aggregate process can get started, where proteins interact in ways that we don't want them uh, to interact inside cells. Um, I should mention, I say it at the bottom here, that probably the current generation of force fields, uh, which were basically uh, adjusted to uh, uh, give good, strong uh, Van der Waals interactions might actually overdo the sticking and crowding in the cytoplasm a little bit. But probably all of these effects I'm talking about here are uh, you know, really happening the way I'm describing them in the cytoplasm, although they may not be as frequent as they are uh, in the simulations. Okay, so that was number one. Uh, so proteins do stick to one another and it occurs on a 100 nanosecond to microsecond time scale. So let's go on to example number two. Um, can we find in vitro conditions 
that actually are somewhat similar, at least to the cell, as far as how things stick to each other and as far as how macromolecules crowd uh, one another. This would be nice because if we can find in vitro conditions, we can do more reproducible experiments, right? Things really vary from cell to cell if you're doing cell biology. But if I do the experiment in a test tube of chemicals where I know what it is, I, I can do more reproducible measurements. So that's a nice feature of in vitro measurements. And of course, nowadays, mostly when we do me measurements, we do it in, in potassium phosphate buffer or something like that, right? But a potassium phosphate buffer really has no resemblance whatsoever to the conditions on the inside of a cell. And so the question is, can we find something that's at least a little bit better if we want to do in vitro experiments? And so I'll show you one example here uh, where we looked at two different proteins. One is an enzyme that's active inside cells uh, called phosphoglycerate kinase. I'm sure many of you know this part of the glyco glycolytic cycle of making ATP. So this produces ATP from ADP and 1,3-bis phosphoglycerate. And then this protein down here, uh, VLSE as it's called, is actually not a cytoplasmic protein. It actually exists in the outer membrane of bacteria. In this case, the bacteria that causes Lyme disease, okay, which is a very unpleasant illness where you, you get bitten by a tick and for a few months, you don't even know that you're sick and then you feel really tired for the rest of your life, basically. It's very unpleasant. Uh, my brother got it, so he, <laughs> and, and he, you know, he's not happy <laughs> with it. So, so this is, sits on the surface of bacteria. This is a protein that's on the inside of the cytoplasm. So we tested two things. One was the crowding. And what we did is we checked what is the stability of the protein against heat. So this delta Tm is an increase in the melting temperature. The higher this value, the more stable the protein is versus the concentration of a crowder. A phycol is a polymer that's made out of sucrose it has a molecular weight of about 70,000 uh, you know, or 70 kilo Dalton. And so it's about the size of a protein, okay? uh, but it's made out of sugar molecules. And indeed what happens is when we uh, add phycol to the solution, you can see the stability slowly increases. And by the time we get to 300 milligrams per milliliter, which is about the concentration of macromolecules inside a cell, you can see our temperature has gone up by about five degrees. Okay? And, um, and, and that's basically what you expect from crowding, okay? This does not match up completely the experimental data though. What we found when we did experiments, I don't have them on the slide here. Actually, sorry, I mean, I've got that. These are the, these are the experimental measures. I don't have the theory on the slide here, but uh, um, uh, <clears throat> what we actually saw inside cells is that uh, the, the stability of phosphoglycerate kinase increases when I add crowding, but the stability of VLSE actually decreases. But in this particular case, you know, it's not inside cells, it's just FIPO, it's just that sugar, the stability of both proteins increases. So it's half the answer, but it doesn't do quite the right thing because actually the blue circles should have gone up and the red circles should have gone down. And that's what they do inside a cell. In fact, here's the data from inside the cell, uh, this data here that's shown as used from a U2OS cell. And you can see VLSE became less stable inside a cell and it became, uh, and, and PGK became more stable inside a cell, whereas in FIPOL, both proteins become more stable. So then the other thing we looked at uh, was cell lysate. So this is basically just to take the inside of a cell and you uh, break the cells open and you make a dilute solution of the contents of everything inside the cell after we get rid of the membrane uh, with detergents, but it doesn't crowd, so it's dilute, okay? Uh, but when we add this cell lysate at concentrations of let's say 10 milligrams per milliliter, now you can see that actually the stability of the phosphoglycerate kinase increases and the stability of the uh, VLSE decreases. But the effect is actually too strong for the VLSE, but it goes down more than what we actually observe really inside cells. But if you combine these two things, you add either cell lysate or actually uh, a special buffer that we call IP lys Pierce IP lysis buffer, then you get the right effect because these two effects, when you add them together, compensate one another a little bit. So, uh, the PGK still increases in stability, but the VLSE decreases, but not as much because it gets compensated a little bit by the uh, addition of FICO. So my recommendation is if you want to do experiments, you want to do them in vitro, and they actually look similar to the kind of behavior that we observe when we do measurements inside cells, um, do the measurement inside 300 milligrams of FICO as part of your buffer and uses your buffer, this Pierce IP lysis buffer. 
And this is going to give you results from the point of view of protein association and protein folding that in a test tube actually look very similar to the kind of dependence that you get when you do the experiment inside a cell, okay? but in a more reproducible environment. So the important thing here is that crowding always causes proteins to just get more stable. If you want to explain why one protein gets more stable inside a cell and another protein gets less stable inside a cell, uh, then you need to actually include these sticking interactions or non-steric interactions. So not just the crowding, but you actually need to explain, uh, you need to have something that your proteins can stick to. And that's what the cell lysate or this lysis buffer does. Okay. So let me move on to the third example. And that's the question is, how strong are uh, uh, interactions between, let's say, enzymes inside a cell? So you might imagine, and certainly this is what people thought in textbooks you know, 20 or 30 years ago, um, that inside a cell, I have like an enzyme like GAPDH that makes two, three bis, uh, sorry, one, three bis phosphoglycerate. And I have another enzyme like PGK that uses that to make ATP, that these things just float around randomly inside the cell, right? And when the GAPDH makes one of those uh, uh, bis phosphoglycerate molecules, it then just diffuses around randomly and eventually it finds a, a PGK molecule and then the re next reaction gets catalyzed in that step. Okay? But this is probably not really what's going on, right? Probably what's happening is actually that these enzymes have some kind of loose attraction to one another, right? That binds them not as strongly as like a strong complex like hemoglobin or something like that, but that still causes them to stick for like a few microseconds and remain near one another. And the obvious advantage of that from a reactivity point of view is that if then uh, one of these enzymes produces something, uh, it doesn't need to diffuse very long to become the substrate of the next enzyme. So you are going to speed up that biochemical cycle by having these enzymes cluster inside cells instead of the molecules being randomly distributed. Okay? So that's the question here. Is how strong are these interactions that cause proteins to cluster inside cells as opposed to just completely randomly diffuse around? The way that we did this experiment is by using osmosis to modulate the cell volume. So imagine that we have a cell in an isotonic solution, you know, roughly 200 millimolar salt. But if I now increase the salt concentration to let's say 600 millimolar, okay, what's gonna happen is water will be pushed out of the cell by osmosis to, into the more concentrated solution above the cell. And I will shrink the cell volume down. Okay. When I shrink the cell volume, that means I have less volume, right? Again, Le Chatelier's principle that should favor any binary association reaction. So if I have two proteins that come together, they could, they, it should be even easier for them to come together and make the complex. So we expect to shift the equilibrium from favoring less complex to favoring more complex formation when we reduce the volume. The way we do the experiment is basically shown over here. So this is a U2OS cell that's adhered on a microscope slide. And what we do is we just, it's in a micro channel, which is invisible here, but there's a very narrow channel. That's like a few, like a hundred microns in diameter. And what we do is we just flow either 300 millimolar solution or 600 millimolar or 300 and 600. We just switch back and forth between these two solutions. And whenever it's a 300 millimolar, as you can see here, the cell is all you know, blown up and big and happy, right? And when we go to 600, so we go up here, you can see these black spots appearing. What that is, is in any place where there is no cytoskeleton, the cell can shrivel up and shrink down. And so there is no more fluorescent dye in it. And so you, you see these dark spots, but it's completely reversible. So when I go uh, up, you know, the cell volume decreases and I get these black spots where the cell is very thin. And if I uh, make the uh, solution isoosmotic, then I just get the fully blown up, you know, normal sized cell again. So what we observe then inside the cell when we do this experiment is if we label one of our proteins with a red dye and the other protein with a green dye, they can come together and exchange energy. So we get more red fluorescence. So we excite the green protein. And when they come together, it can transfer energy to the red protein and fluoresce in the red. And so that's what we see. When we shrink the cell, the red fluorescence goes up and the green fluorescence goes down. And then when we expand the cell again, the green fluorescence goes up and the red fluorescence goes down. And from the amount by which this happens, so how much is this change and how quickly does that change happen? We can actually measure the thermodynamics and the kinetics of this chemical reaction. Okay. And as I mentioned already, the one that we looked at in this case is we labeled some GAPDH, which is the enzyme in the glycolysis cycle before PGK. And then we labeled some PGK, this one in red and this one in green. And indeed, when we do the experiment, we shrink the cell size to 60% of the original volume. 
we can see the red goes up, the green goes down. When we expand the cell to 40% bigger than the original wall, the green goes up and the red goes down. The opposite happens, right? Because the cell is expanded, so there's less association reaction. So we can then use these curves and fit them to a thermodynamic model. And what that model basically tells us oops, in this case is that the uh, uh, association uh, ratio between the two, so basically how many gap the H molecules alpha do we have versus PGK molecules in a complex is two to one. So we have two of these guys and one of the phosphoglycerate kinase. And the other thing the model tells us is that the effective KD value, so the dissociation value for the complex is 14 micromolar. Okay? So that's pretty weak. I mean, those of you who worry about drugs binding to proteins or, or things of that sort, you know that you want picomolar or nanomolar kind of association constants, right? Not micromolar, that would be a pretty terrible uh, binding for a drug. But 14 micromolar is good enough in the cytoplasm for these proteins to sort of diffuse near one another and spend a fair amount of time close to one another, which accelerates the biochemical uh, reaction. Um, so this is an example of what we call quinary structure inside cells, which are complexes that are weaker than the kinds of strong complexes that we usually like to think of like a drug protein binding, but that still improve the function of the cell by allowing, um, uh, in this case, the substrate to diffuse for a smaller distance. Okay. Um, now, quinary interactions can also do the opposite. So my fourth example here is how much can sticking actually interfere with favorable interactions in, of a complex? Think of it basically this way. Um, Often, right, when we design uh, like a drug binding to a protein, we do experiments where we want to get the highest binding constant of the drug to the protein or of the protein to the other protein, right? And we do it in the test tube, okay? And then we're very happy if we get a nanomolar, you know, binding constant or something like that. However, when this is used in real life, it has to go inside a cell to do the job. Now, inside a cell, there are thousands of other proteins and macromolecules and sugars and lipids and transfer RNAs and all kinds of other molecules floating around. And your proteins could be binding to any of these as well, right? So it's actually not just good enough to design two proteins to bind to one another strongly if you want to have an effect. Um, you need to also make sure they don't, they don't bind to anything else. That's actually a much harder thing. It's actually pretty easy to design two things that bind to each other well but it's much harder to design them so they bind to each other well and they don't bind to anything else, okay? So we looked at this uh, effect in the case of the interaction of the protein U1A uh, with the RNA SL2. Uh, and U1A and SL2 in the cell form a complex that's part of an organelle that's called the spliceosome. Again, many of you have heard of this. The spliceosome is the organelle that binds to pre-messenger RNA after it's been transcribed from the DNA and then cuts out the junk DNA or the introns that are not supposed to go to the ribosome, then puts it back together again so that you have now the final messenger RNA, and then that goes to the ribosome to make proteins. Okay, so in eukaryotic cells, the protein, the RNA that gets made in the nucleus gets cut up and put back together again before it gets to go to the ribosome. And U1 is one of the pieces that does this, uh, finding the RNA and then, and then cutting the RNA. Okay. So in mammals, as I've already mentioned a couple of times, there's usually about 150 millimolar potassium uh, ions, and then the total ionic strength is about 200 uh, millimolar. And indeed, when we do in vitro an experiment where we uh, uh, change the potassium ion concentration, okay, going from 100 to what is inside the cell, about 200 is the total ionic strength, 500 would be much more than what you get inside a cell. What we actually find is that the binding constant of uh, this pair, you know, this protein and this RNA, uh, the KD increases, so the binding decreases. Right? It goes from 10 to the minus 12, which is a really strong affinity picomolar, right? It goes up to 10 to the minus uh, five almost, right? Which is a very weak binding region. And inside a cell, we get about 10 to the minus eight. So still a pretty strong binding, but not as strong because of the screening by the salt. And then, as I mentioned, the other thing the cell can do is, is crowd things. And so in this case, we used as our crowder polyethylene glycol 3550, which is a macromolecular polymer. And just like we would expect when you add crowder, then the binding gets better. So the KD, the dissociation constant gets smaller. And again, that's simply because if I crowd, then I favor smaller uh, volume states, which means I favor the association of those two, the protein and the RNA uh, to come together. So this is in vitro, but what happens inside of a real cell? Okay, so we stuck this pair 
of uh, RNA and protein inside a U2OS cell, put it on a microscope, and then again used FRET to actually tell whether the two are coming together or not. So we labeled the RNA with a red dye and we labeled the U1A with a green fluorescent protein. And when they come together, uh, then you get energy transfer again. So you get red fluorescence and when they don't come together, you get more green fluorescence. Okay? So we did that experiment and we measured what is the KD in vitro and what is it inside a cell? And there's quite a difference actually. So the KD value for this association constant in vitro, as I mentioned under physiological uh, salt con uh, conditions is 10 to the minus eight when I'm at 200 millimolar. Inside a cell, even though it's about the same physiological salt concentration, it's only at four times 10 to the minus six. Okay? So the KD has gone up by a factor of 400, more than two orders of magnitude, which means the complex forms over 100 times more weakly inside the cell than it does in the test tube. And the reason for this is that while this complex is able to form inside a cell, it has to compete with lots of other things that it can bind to. And each one of those other interactions just by a little bit reduces the binding, right? And, but if you have hundreds or thousands of those interactions, then they really begin to make a difference by orders of magnitude, okay? So this is one reason why you have to be very careful. And just because something has a very nice low KD value in vitro does not mean it's gonna have a low KD value when you actually stick it inside a cell because there's a lot of competitive binding with other things that compete for the same uh, interaction. Okay? So, uh, so that's basically the conclusion from, from this segment here. All right, number five, and I'm looking at the time here. Yeah, I, I, I know I have at least time for number five and maybe even six before we finish up. Um, so the next question I want to ask as far as protein behavior inside cells, and I've got only this one slide on it here, is how sensitive and cooperative is liquid-liquid phase separation um, when you have cases where the two partners are not IDPs? So let me explain this a little bit. Um, as again, many of you know, a significant fraction of proteins inside mammalian cells are actually disordered. They don't even fold, right? We tend to think of, well, proteins fold, but actually, you know, about 30% of proteins don't fold. Very often, these proteins are pretty highly charged proteins that can diffuse around inside the cell, unfold it, find a binding partner that has the opposite charge, let's say a positively charged unfolded protein and an RNA, which is negatively charged, and then can actually bind and fold when it binds, okay? Um, however, it turn, and, and it turns out in many cases, these kinds of uh, uh, peptides can be quite toxic to the cell if they occur in high concentration. For instance, the, uh, um, some of the components of the spliceosome that I just mentioned that are partly unfolded can actually bind to RNA and interfere with uh, transcription. And so that is a toxic side effect. So one possible mechanism the cell may have found to counteract that is to allow these kinds of polyelectrolytes to condense uh, into these phase separated regions where they can be stored. Of course, these regions probably have other purposes as well. Maybe they accelerate chemical reactions by making concentrations higher. There could be all kinds of purposes for these uh, uh, liquid-liquid phase separated regions. But the example I want to show you here is for the same protein uh, RNA pair that we just talked about. And U1A is a completely folded protein, so it's not an IDP. And the RNA is a completely folded RNA. And even in that case, you can actually form liquid liquid phase separated regions. So if you look at this image of a cell, it's again, this, it's that same protein pa RNA pair that I was talking about in the previous slide. Um, if you look at this u 2 s cell, you can actually see in the nucleus, these bright areas like here and here and here. And these are actually areas that are where the concentration of uh, U1A and SL2 RNA is much higher than in either the surrounding nucleus and certainly in the cytoplasm. You can see there's still a little fluorescence here. So there's some in the cytoplasm, there's more in the nucleus, but there's far more inside these condensates inside uh, the nucleus. And it turns out these condensates can be quite temperature sensitive, which is a nice uh, feature if you want to study them. And they can be quite cooperative. So they really are. I mean, people are not joking when they're saying that these are phase separated regions in the sense of a phase transition, right? Um, so here, what I'm plotting for you is actually the intensity of the uh, U1A SL2 fluorescence, the excess intensity over the nucleus. So how much brighter are these spots compared to the background uh, in the nucleus, okay? And so zero would be the nuclear fluorescence and one would be the maximum fluorescence inside one of the liquid phase separated regions. And you can see the region is quite stable at 20 degrees, 25 and so forth. But eventually when I heat up the cell at a temperature of 33 degrees Celsius, in this case, there is a sudden transition 
uh, where the LLSPR, this liquid phase separated region, essentially completely dissolves. I don't have the picture here, but you can see it. If you look in the microscope, you see all of those speckles inside the nucleus, and then suddenly they just disappear. When we cool it back down, because it's completely reversible, they just reappear. So this is a completely reversible phase transition that can occur inside the nucleus of a cell that can store away this RNA and this protein, or it can release it into the rest of the nucleus so it can interact with other nuclear uh, components. Uh, of course, we would probably expect that this kind of phenomenon in, inside a real organism would occur more likely close to 37 degrees Celsius if it's, let's say, a human <coughs> at our body temperature. Um, but again, keep in mind that this is a pretty artificial pair that we've labeled here. There's many more things that it can interact with that we didn't put into this mix here to make this particular liquid-liquid phase separated region. But so the bottom line is that we can use cells as little test tubes to study the formation and cooperative uh, dissolution of these phase separated regions inside different parts of the cell. Okay, so it is now um, 1050. Uh, and so actually what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna skip six not that it's not an interesting example. And for two minutes, just show you the last one here before I finish up so that we have some time for questions. And, and this one here is one that's, despite the complex looking diagram, it's pretty easy to follow. Okay. What the question we were asking here is, does the folding of the same protein differ from tissue to tissue in an animal? Right? We all know that proteins can undergo post-translational modification that hooks up different things to a protein that can make this protein behave very differently. So here, think of this as post-post-translational modification. Does it make a difference, for instance, whether a protein is expressed inside a liver cell, a muscle tissue cell, a skin cell, an eye lens cell, and so forth, as far as how this protein is going to behave, how stable is it going to be, will it unfold or not, will it react or not, okay? And the way we do these experiments is by basically making transgenic fish that express the protein. But we don't use CRISPR-Cas9 for this. Uh, and I'll explain to you why. We actually use something called uh, SCI or iSCI. Uh, and what it is is basically a protein um, that it's an endonuclease, uh, a meganuclease, in fact, is what people call it, that searches for a 30 base pair long sequence in the DNA binds to that and then cuts the DNA and inserts something else, okay? So it kind of, uh, but it's very inefficient because of that, because it needs to find that exact 30, you know, uh, amino acid, sorry, 30 base pair sequence. So what actually happens when you use it is the same thing that happens with CRISPR-Cas9, you get genetic modification of the organism, but because it is extremely inefficient, uh, because in, in this fish, for instance, that we're looking at, these are zebra fish, you don't have this 30 base pair sequence. So what actually happens is this, uh, ISKI I just randomly once in a while binds somewhere on the DNA once in a billion times and then cuts it and inserts something. So the result of this is that you can make actually organisms that are transgenic only in a single cell. Okay? So inside this fish that has millions and millions of cells, there's one single muscle cell uh, inside the spine, you know, near the spinal cord of this fish that is actually transgenic and you can see it fluorescing because it has our proteins expressed that we want to look at it. So then we put this fish under the microscope, look at the single cell or maybe just a few uh, handful of cells. And then we can again, inside the cell, measure the kinetics and the stability by heating or cooling the fish and looking at the kinetics by jumping the temperature quickly and, and time resolving uh, the kinetics. So we can measure the stability of proteins, of complexes inside a live animal. And because we can direct with different promoters that are uh, specific to different tissues, we can put it in an eye cell, we can put it in a neuron, we can put it in a muscle cell, we can put it in the belly, we can put it anywhere we want uh, inside of this fish. And here's what we found, and that's the last slide of my talk. Um, we tried several different tissue types, and indeed, in every one of those tissues, you get a different stability for the protein. There's actually a full range of about seven degrees Celsius of stability of this protein phosphoglycerate kinase that I mentioned before that we studied the enzyme that makes ATP. Okay. Now, this may seem like a fairly small change, like, okay, fine, like seven degrees, the difference between that green and orange curve is even just three degrees. But think if this were not an enzyme, but a signaling protein, right? Then at this temperature here at 37, uh, it's 100% folded in the island cell, the orange one, right? And it's 80% unfolded in the muscle cell, which is the green one, right? Under the exact same temperature uh, conditions. So it's easy to imagine then if you have signaling proteins or proteins that could be disordered or become ordered, um, 
that you know, inside different tissues, you could actually make use of this difference here because protein folding is a very cooperative transition. So you could have them fold in completely different ways inside different tissues and therefore have the same protein sequence behave differently depending on what uh, tissue it's actually in. Okay, so I'm gonna stop here because my time is up. Um, I have put up the conclusions again from the various sections, but I already talked about it while I was giving the talk. So I'm not gonna read this again for you. And thank you again for letting me give a talk. And uh, you know, I'd be more than happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, thank, thank you very, very much, uh, Martin, for your excellent talk. Uh, now you, we open the session for questions. Now someone has some question to ask Martin. Mm, and please, especially students, ask questions. I don't buy it. You know, <laughs> uh, okay. no question is too simple. Uh, it's one thing that I learned early on is that I ask even my simple questions because actually, very often the person goes like, "Ooh, that sounds simple, but it's not simple." <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you want, you could uh, put your questions in a chat, and then I ask Martin if you feel more comfortable with that. Yes, and that's perfectly fine as well. Yeah. Uh, but uh, if there are no question, I could start with some simple question <laughs> in your last slide. Uh, what is uh, the, what you think there is the, um, the meaning uh, of this uh, different, the, 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 the phys physiological meaning uh, of this different stability of the um, proteins in the different tissues? Yes, so, so I'll be completely honest. In this particular experiment where we did this with phosphoglycerate kinase uh, that we had destabilized by mutation, the organism probably doesn't have any, any physiological or, you know, reason for doing this, right? There is a difference in stability, uh, but it's not gonna make the difference whether under practical conditions for this fish, which lives at 25 degrees, you know, whether the protein will be unfolded or not. But I think what we are going to find as we do more of these experiments, and we're actually studying this right now, in the part that I left out, <laughs> the, the number six or whatever it was, is there are actually a lot of signaling proteins inside uh, cells, right? Um, that depending on the ionic strength, the pH, the temperature of their environment will actually fold into one state when they are under certain condition and fold into a different state when they're in a different one. So for instance, you might have a skin cell at the surface that's at relatively low temperature. And uh, there is a protein in there that will actually fold differently or interact differently than it would if it were inside your core where your temperature is, you know, 30, 70 degrees Celsius. So I think there's probably actually a lot of signaling going on where identical signaling proteins, like let's say kinases, okay, depending on what cell they're in and what the temperature, pH, ionic strength, crowding conditions of that particular cell are, uh, will actually switch on and off differently in these cells. So this actually allows an organism with the same protein to get even more function, right? Because you can have the protein do different things at different times in different types of cells. So I think that's where this is gonna turn out to be relevant. And I see uh, Jose has a question. Okay. Uh, so uh, I, uh, now, now uh, we have a question from our uh, president, from the president of our school, both the, uh, Zoom. No, no, I'm, 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 I'm just an attendee here. <laughs> oh. oh, you had your hand raised. So you had your hand raised. That's why I was you know, wondering. I think maybe you just pushed the button. That's okay. You yeah, but, but no, no. But I, I, I was just saying, Jose or John Carlos, that I'm not here, the president. I'm just an attendee. But yeah, it's yeah. a pleasure to hit, say you hello, Martin. Thank you very thank much you. for your contribution. But I have thanks indeed, for having me I, out. I have indeed a question. Uh, when I see here in the same slide, the eye lens proteins uh, mm -hmm. being depicted, it, mm -hmm. it raises me a, a question. Uh, one of the origins of cataract is probably cataract that blinds us uh, later in life. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is probably related with folding and denaturation of the internal yeah. proteins of the eye, yes. of, the, of the eye lens. So uh, is there any new information on that or the, this uh, science opens the possibility to pharmacologically or with, with another process unfold those without a cataract surgery? <laughs> yes, exactly. So, so an experiment that you could do here is to actually make labeled versions of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, the crystalline, which is the protein that in the, it's actually very interesting. Crystalline used to be an enzyme evolutionarily actually, right? but it got transformed into a transparent protein that fills up your eye lens tissue almost completely. And okay, Jose, so you won't be surprised, of course, if you look at the curve, right? 
where which which cell in your body has the most stable environment for a protein so it stays folded for absolutely as long as possible well it's the island right it's the orange curve and it shouldn't be surprising because the islands doesn't get a lot of blood vessels near it or anything like that once the proteins in it fold and the lens has formed that's more or less it, right? There is not a lot of correction that can go on. So you really want your proteins to last for absolutely as long as it possibly can without unfolding. And the island is indeed the environment. So this is the, the tissue where we found the longest lifetime for folded proteins inside a fish. In, in that is condition. very important because I see, I see there is a change about 37 degrees that probably is the internal temperature of the eye. So there is exactly. some people that say probably the cataract is not exactly the response, the, the, well, the, the consequence of UV light uh, changing mm -hmm. uh, because the, one of the functions of the crystalline lens is to retain some UV light and do not exactly. allow to reach the retina. Exactly. But here, exactly. some people say, probably we are at the boiling point of the crystalline lens for, uh, for mm -hmm. 40, 60 years. So cataract is no more than the consequence of that. Exactly, probably and I think that plays a, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, so I actually agree with that. Uh, and I think, I mean, again, I don't think we know the answer to this conclusively yet, but it's exactly like what you're saying. It's exactly like what you're saying. I mean, by having this protein at 37 degrees, in most other parts of our body, proteins continuously get degraded and resynthesized, right? It's not a problem, but not in the islands because it's nah. you know, filled with the, and, and indeed, uh, for these fish, for instance, the boiling point of the protein, so to speak, is only about uh, you know, 15 degrees above the maximum temperature where they live. Uh, for humans, it's actually probably likely even closer. And so I think it's exactly what you're saying is that over, it's like amyloids, right? Amyloids are not very likely to form, but if you give it 70 years, <laughs> even a low <laughs> probability chemical reaction is going to happen. And the same thing in the islands tissue. So these proteins are quite stable, but they're not infinitely stable. And so eventually they will uh, denature. And so we haven't done those experiments yet, but actually that's a very interesting suggestion. So we might try that because we could actually fluorescent label the crystalline itself instead of looking at the PGK pro protein and then see what it's unfolding in the islands uh, looks like. Yeah. Well, we all agree. We, we all thank a solution for that in the next coming years. Thank you so much. Yes. And then I think Nuno has a question. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have... Uh, here in uh, another question in the, in, the, in the chat from our colleague Paulo Ferreira. Um, Martin, do you see the, the question or you want me to ask? Oh, go, go ahead and ask it. You know, then I, I, I think, uh, let me see, I can open study, up the chat. Uh, could your studies be extended to other biopolymers in, in the cell? Uh, for example, polys, polysaccharides? Uh, yes. Uh, so we have not looked at polysaccharides, although that's actually a very interesting topic, but we have looked pretty extensively at RNA as well. So we've studied proteins and RNAs uh, so far. And just as you might expect, RNAs, of course, can also acquire some secondary structure and can uh, you know, fold into various shapes. And we have looked at that. Um, Saccharides are actually very interesting because they are very difficult to study, right? There's much less research on saccharides and saccharide structure. And it may be that they're not quite as perfectly folded in a way as a protein is, but saccharides clearly have real residual structure that forms, right? And, and that's gonna be different inside cells than when you, let's say, do an NMR experiment inside a test tube. Um, so actually it would be relatively easy to do such experiments. So let's say, for instance, you want to do a measurement where you want to ask the question, where, where a, does a certain polysaccharide that might be expanded in aqueous solution, does it contract inside the cell to form a compact shape? That might be one question you want to answer. Yes, the answer is we could actually label that polysaccharide with a uh, uh, by by making a, a reaction that puts, um, let's say, a a uh, sulfhydryl bond on a, f a very small fraction, like one percent or something, of the uh, of the uh, sugars. We could actually derivatize it with a dye, just like we do the protein and the RNA. And then we could do those kinds of energy transfer experiments. We look at is it green or is it red? Right, red means compact green means expanded but we haven't done those experiments yet but that might be a very interesting way of studying how sugars behave inside cells thanks paul i don't know if you have more questions i have another question uh, in your uh, question six i suppose you show the influence of uh, um, potassium in, in also um, pg 
uh, you know, yes, uh, four years. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I've got it. Yeah. Um, and uh, what uh, uh, um, what he thinks here in the plot of the, the dependence of, of uh, uh, KV with um, uh, so, uh, with potassium uh, chloride, mm -hmm. you see some uh, some sort of uh, saturation uh, behavior in the, the curve. Does it have any meaning or? Ah, yeah. That, I mean, that's that's an interesting question. So. Uh, it, as you as you observed, right, this curve isn't just kind of going up like a straight line. It eventually actually levels off, and at very high ionic strength, there isn't much of an effect anymore. And so, yeah, so the meaning here is basically just, you know, if you think of the Debye-Huckel law, although that's just an approximation, of course, compared to the screening that goes on at high concentrations. Once you exceed a certain salt concentration, right, the penetration of the Coulomb electric field from the charged protein and RNA towards one another so they can attract one another, um, that penetration becomes less than the size of a water molecule. And at that point, even when the RNA and the protein almost come next to each other, they still don't sense one another because the concentration of potassium is, uh, ions is so large, the screening is so strong that the Coulomb attraction essentially completely disappears. So in terms of that diagram that I showed earlier on in my talk, like this picture here, right? If I increase the salt concentration, then this energy minimum here becomes smaller and smaller until eventually it just uh, disappears. And I, I get neither the minimum nor do I get the repulsion. I get a more or less flat uh, potential curve until the protein and the RNA you know, basically literally stick into uh, one another. So, so this is a, uh, is a screening effect that causes that uh, leveling off at high concentration. Uh, thank you very um, much. By the way, this is a, 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 it's a very interesting question. People have actually observed that for many molecules, uh, that uh, small molecules inside cells at about one molar concentration, right, which is about twice the concentration here, the molecule doesn't show up at any higher concentration because it doesn't do any more good. Uh, for example, there are these deep sea fish that live at thousands of meters right below the surface of the ocean at high pressure. And they have inside their cells a small molecule called trimethylamine oxide, TMAO. Okay? Um, but none of these fish have a concentration higher than one molar, no matter how deep you go. And we looked into this and we found that, you know, it's the same thing happens. If I add more than one molar, the curve saturates. And so it doesn't do the organism any good to make any higher concentration than that. Uh, and I think Nuno, Nuno had a question. Yes, Nuno, yes. So, yes, thank you. It's a bit on the sides. Um, you mentioned in the beginning of, uh, of your talk, and uh, it was an excellent talk, by the way. Thank you very much. Um, you mentioned um, the use of machine learning to, to try to, mm -hmm. to, to do this folding by comparing with experimental data. Mm -hmm. Uh, is it possible to to try to go a bit uh, beyond that and uh, not only comparing to what you know, but trying among all these huge databases to to find interesting patterns that can be useful for finding new new folding schemes or even uh, new solutions or even new laws which can eventually help you to to do it analytically but faster. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And in fact, you know, because I'm kind of an analytical person, as you were just saying, that would be like my favorite way of making use of machine learning. So, so what Nuna is talking about, just you know, to sort of go back to this question for everyone, is the, the, the way that we ran our computer simulations is to basically just take Newton's equations and we have a force field, you know, like an attractive potential between the atoms in, in the protein and the stretching of the bonds and all of that. And then we just run the simulation and we see if it falls or not. The alternative approach uh, for getting protein structures is to actually do machine learning and train your uh, neural networks on a very large database of existing proteins where we know what the structures are and then see if you can predict what an unknown structure looks like. And this has had a lot of success over the last 20 years. It's just gotten better and better. Um, they, they, they were at about 30% accuracy about 20 years ago. Uh, two years ago, they were at 70% accuracy, so already quite respectable. And then AlphaFold actually reached 90% accuracy uh, last year, which made like a big splash in, in, this, in this field. So, so that means you can take basically totally unknown sequences of a protein where you don't know what the structure is. Nobody has done x-ray crystallography. Nobody has done NMR or anything. 
and you just predict the structure and 90% of the time you're going to be right, at least in this contest when, when, with the proteins that people have picked. But what Nuno is talking about is let's not just do that and train the algorithm and then it knows how to find folded proteins, but it doesn't tell us really how it did it or what's, what's going on. But can we maybe couple machine learning uh, by doing the machine learning on data that has been clustered or grouped in some kind of way that we think might be analytically useful. Like for instance, we could do the machine learning on are there correlations with hydrophobicity or with hydrophilic residues in the protein on the surface versus in the interior, things like this. And if we put those kinds of constraints into machine learning models, then the machine learning can actually help us learn as well. Uh, as opposed to just giving us an answer. Uh, there's a physicist, uh, Eugene Wigner, who uh, is famously quoted for saying, so I'll, I'll repeat his quote here. He was at a, a talk uh, 60 years ago, like or 50, yeah, in the 1960s, right? Where somebody showed a computer simulation instead of doing an analytical calculation for the first time. And, and Wigner raised his hand at the end of the lecture and went, uh, uh, sir, um, it's nice that the computer understands, but I would like to understand it too. <laughs> and that was really the, the problem. So the, problem of, the problem of machine learning is, is really can give us the right answers uh, if we train it on good enough data sets, but we haven't used it that much yet to actually help us learn too. Uh, but I think we can by doing the training on data sets that have been, as Nuno was saying, basically massaged to already take into account the physical phenomena that we're looking at, as opposed to just let it do whatever it wants. And I think we're going to see a lot more of that in science, that, uh, that uh, machine learning can actually assist even theory formation uh, by being fed things, uh, not just raw data, but actually data that has been intelligently thought about by people as to how you want to feed it. So I think that's, yes, that's a big thing uh, that we will probably get into in the next 10 years or so. In my Thank you very much. I would not know if there is any, any more questions. questions. Well, and you know, it's 11 11, so we're like up, we're, we're up with time anyway. <laughs> uh, so I don't know if there is more, any more, more questions. So um, I don't know if uh, there are no more, more questions. I suppose that uh, we could finish our session here. Um, and thanks, uh, Martin, once again for. Uh, this is excellent talk and uh, this is an excellent and inspiring talk Thank for you. me. <laughs> well, and of course, I really hope uh, that you know next year with the pandemic, you know, hopefully beginning to eventually wind down, that it'll be much more fun to travel again. I actually come to Europe reasonably often. You know, my, one of my parents still lives there, so I, I go to Germany. Or whatever. I wouldn't mind visiting, right? Because the original plan was that at some point we would do a visiting. Wow, might come here, might come there. So we'll see what happens, but hopefully things will be easier again uh, next year. But still, it was it was nice uh, to at least be able to give uh, the lecture by Zoom, you know, remotely. So thank you, everyone, and especially also everyone who asked questions. Thank you very much, Martin. Yep. See so you. Take care, guys. Okay. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye, bye everyone. <laughs>